Hello, welcome to Toronto Bible Study. I'm your host, Mike Sampat. And today I'm going to talk about this verse from Romans chapter 3. There a lot of people try to use it to prove Calvinism or to prove... Um, some people, they're not, they're not Calvinists, but they, they, they call themselves predestinarians. And they, and they, they basically believe that that fundamental Calvinist doctrine that, um, or what's what they call total depravity, which is the idea that humans are so evil that they cannot believe the gospel unless God basically makes them believe it. So I just want to talk about this verse from Romans because they always bring up this one. I mean, among many things they always bring up, but this is one kind of gets me mad. So, this is it. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. This is from Psalm 14. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But what I wanted to show you first is that he's talking about Jews and Gentiles as groups here. Okay? He's not trying to say that like he's like he's the the conversation is about Jews and Gentiles, and and uh, we might speculate about why that why he's doing it. Some people think there's some kind of conflict in the Roman Church between J- Jews and Gentiles. That's hard to really prove. It may maybe or maybe not. I don't know. There's no reason to assume that though, because these kind of conflicts or this kind of like questions about the Jews and their role in Christianity and, and what and what, what's their status now. The, the, these are questions that will come up for any Christian, right? And he's probably encountered these kind of questions, these kind of issues throughout his life, throughout his career. And this is, he writes this letter later in his career and it's to the, to probably the biggest church in the world at the time, right? The Roman church, the, the biggest city in the world. Or in the known world. So probably what he's doing is just saying, Hey, let me just clear up these things that I've seen so many times in my career, especially the Jew Gentile thing. And let me just clear up some of these, some of these issues with this Roman church because they're the biggest and I've never even visited them yet. You know? So I think that's why he's explaining these things. I don't think there's any necessarily any conflict in the Roman church um, leading to these comments. But yeah, he, he is, a lot of this letter is dedicated to that. Like, what is, the, what is the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in the Christian theology? You know? And so, he comes to this. So the question is, what then? Are we better than they? He's saying we the Jews better than they, the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So that's what he's trying to prove, that Jews are not better than Gentiles. Okay, we're all under sin. That's what he's trying to prove. So then he says this thing. He quotes this passage from Psalm 14. Among other things he quotes here, you know, this is all from Psalm 14. And this is from some other Psalms. But he's not talking about the same people and the same thing. But this one is Psalm 14. As it is written, there is not, none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, you can see this is Psalm 14 here. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. That David is talking about the fool. Okay? The fool being the kind of opposite of the wise or the righteous, you know? And, And you see that a lot in wisdom literature. They have this kind of... 
bisection of the human race, you know, into the fool and the wise, or the righteous and the wicked, you know? And it's not meant to say that there literally are some people who are just wise, and there literally are some people who are just, just purely wicked. But it's just trying to give you this... This... Um, there's two ways you can go on, on any given thing, you know, and, and it's telling you to pick the wise way. But this is the one where Paul is quoting here, 14 to down to, uh, I think, three. Yeah. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Um, so this one doesn't even say. Oh, so, yeah, because he's saying, if there were any that did understand and seek God. And so it says there are none. Right? But this is obviously, uh, what do they call it? Hyperbole. Okay? He's obviously not saying that there's no human being on the face of the earth that ever sought God, right? Because David sought God, you know? And then, and some people will say, or whoever wrote this psalm was obviously a seeker after God, okay? So, and clearly not everybody in ancient Israel in the Old Testament was like this, just filthy, doeth no, that none that doeth good, no, not one. You think God would describe Moses that way? Do you think God would describe, you know, so many people, right? And so what, what these Calvinists and other people would try to say is that, well, all those people in the Bible that the Bible describes as righteous, such as Job or Noah, right? Those people, they, they, the Holy Spirit was the thing that made them be good. But the Bible doesn't say that. Okay, the Bible doesn't say the Holy Spirit made David be good or seek God. Neither does it say that about Job or, or Noah or anyone. Any of those old prophets, yeah? Once in a while you'll see, oh, the, the Lord, the God, God's Spirit went on them or something, you know? But even that's usually after they do something good. You know what I mean? So... Like, there's, there's one point where it says how, how Joshua had the spirit, I think, you know? But it's like Joshua, it's because Joshua was being very good his whole life, you know? So, yeah, the idea that people are just naturally so corrupt that they never seek God, they, they never seek God, and they do no good, there's none that doeth good, this is hyperbole, okay? This is not, he's not literally saying, that there is no human on the face of the earth who seeks God, okay? And I guess just to show you some other reasons why you shouldn't believe this, right? Um, what's that Hebrews passage? Let me see. There's a Hebrews passage where they talk about... Um, like... How God is a rewarder of them that, that seek him. Okay. Yeah, let's go there. So this is the, the faith chapter of Hebrews. Okay, very important. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Uh, through faith we understand these things. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Like he doesn't say, you know, he's talking about the faith things, right? None of these, in none of these characters in the Bible does it say that God gave them faith. Not one, not one of these characters in this in this chapter that it goes over, right? Never does the Bible say, "Oh, God gave them faith, and then they did this, this, and this." Never once, not even one of these characters, not one, okay? If we go down to, to verse 6 here. Yeah, 
Yeah, look at Enoch. Look at Enoch. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. Okay? And again, it doesn't say that God made him please him. Because that would be stupid. Why would like, like what, what would be the point of God? Like everybody's evil. And then God just, oh, he picks Enoch. He says, Enoch, he makes Enoch good or pleasing to God. And then he, and then he's, he makes him so pleasing to God that he brings him up to heaven. Well, why wouldn't you do that for everybody, God? Why are you just doing it for him? It doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous what these people teach, okay? Anyone who teaches this predestinarian or Calvinist thing that people can't believe the gospel unless God makes them, that's foolish and ridiculous, okay? Why would God tell us to believe the gospel if we can't? It's just, it's completely absurd, okay? But anyway, so Enoch pleased God. So clearly, Enoch, so clearly that verse in Psalm 14 that I just read to you, that doesn't describe Enoch, right? And so, and so in order for these guys, these Calvinists and predestinarians to make the claim that Enoch and Noah and people like that were how, how, like, how do you explain those people? Job or whatever. How do you explain that? Because according to your interpretation of Psalm 14 and, and Romans 311, people such as Enoch and Job should not even exist, right? But they do. So for them to now for them to get around it now, what they do is they say that the that God made them do it. But the Bible doesn't say that. So that kind of argument, that kind of um sort of defense of of a of an argument, right? When 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 somebody points out a problem with your theory, like that their theory is that nobody ever seeks after God because that's what it says in Romans 3:11. No one is seeking out no one seeks after God. But then you have these people like Enoch, Noah, Job. So what do you do? So now they have to explain that those like sort of anomalous observations that go against their theory, right? So what they say is that, oh, God made them. Because their whole, their whole idea is that God, unless God makes you believe the gospel, you can't. Or, or many of them will say that any good thing you do is God literally made you do it, okay? Um, so... They say that, that these people, Enoch, Noah, and Job, and people such as that, that God made them do those righteous things, and that's why. But well, we don't read that in the Bible. There's no evidence. There's no data in the Bible that supports that claim. The, the claim that, Enoch, that God made Enoch good, or, or, or any of them, Job or, or Noah, right? So when you make a claim like that to, to kind of explain away a problem in your theory, but, but the claim you're making to explain the thing, there's no evidence for it, and there's no, there's no way to test it, and there's no way to under, like, prove your claim, that thing is called ad hoc. That's a form of, it's a form of reasoning, of bad reasoning, called ad hoc. And it means like for this or it's for it's for this reason, for this objection to your theory, that that's why you came up with with this idea that God made them. Right. So it's for this It's for this objection that you came up with this thing. You, you didn't come up with it because you observed it or because that was just that's the reality. You just came up with it because you needed it to answer this objection to your theory, all right? And so that's a bad form of reasoning because even if it were true, there's no way we could know. There's no way to prove it. There's no indication from the Bible that that's the case. The Bible is the source of our theology, right? For most Christians anyway. And if the Bible doesn't say that, then there's no reason to believe it. But they want you to believe it because they want you to believe their, theolo their theology, okay?
And it's and their theology is based on taking verses such as this, Romans 3.11, and taking it out of context and making you just read it by itself. There's none that understand it. There's none that seek it after God. You see that? So that means no human on, on earth in the entire history of the planet earth has ever sought after God. That's what that means. And they're just like, look, just deal with it. Like the Bible never uses hyperbole. The Bible never uses, um, you know, figures of speech or anything like that. We we don't need to carefully analyze these things. We don't need to do that. We just have to just like read that thing and just that's what it means. Exactly what it means. Exactly what it says. That's what it means. But anyway, look at this one because he says this: without faith, it is impossible to please him. So Enoch pleased him. Enoch must have had faith, right? He pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So Enoch had faith. But for those Calvinists and stuff, the only way Enoch can have faith is if God gives him the faith. Okay, but it, nowhere does it say in the Bible that God gave Enoch faith. So in order for them to continue in that belief that they have, they have to assert this thing that God made Enoch have faith without any evidence. Okay? So that's why their argument is weak. It's ad hoc and it's foolish. Okay? So don't believe it. And uh, yeah, I hope that helps. Oh, one more thing I was going to show you. Maybe, maybe this isn't that important, but... I don't know. Maybe it is. Because in 1 Corinthians 3, another one that, that, that certain particular people that, that I get in arms about, about over this Calvinism business, certain of them like to pick out this verse. Because there's this, there's this section in, in, in the Corinthian church, right? Paul's writing to the Corinthian church here. And um, there's some st- as he says here, there's some strife and divisions among them. Because some of them are saying, oh, look, I was baptized by Paul. And another will say, oh, I was baptized by Apollos. Or, I was baptized by this guy, by that guy. And it's like, Paul's saying, who cares who you were baptized by? Don't, don't, don't make that into a thing. Right? But then these people, so... That's the basis of their disagreement there, right? So then, for that reason, Paul comes with this thing. Um, hang on. Uh, there's another one where, it, anyway. So this is what he's talking about that. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? He's saying that's, that's a carnal or fleshly way of thinking about these things, and not spiritual, not as they should as Christians. That's why he's saying they're carnal, they're carnal Christians, as, as some people say. You know? they're, they're not walking in the, in the spirit as they should. They're, they're still having that flesh mind. But then look what he says here. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So they, they, what these guys do is they take this line by itself. And they say, because they know people kind of know this story in the Corinthian church. So they, they, get, they know people kind of know that already, that background. So they just read this verse. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So they say, look, Paul may have planted and Apollos may have watered, but God gave the increase. So that means God made the people believe the gospel. Paul can go around and plant all the seeds he wants, and Apollos can go around and water them all. But that doesn't make people believe the gospel. Only when God gives the increase, only then do they believe the gospel. But is that what Paul's talking about? No, I don't think so. Because look in the previous verse. 
Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed? So it's by them that they believed, by Paul and Apollos, not by God. Not by God, okay? It's by these two that they believed. And then look at this. They, these are the, they are, Paul and Apollos are the ministers by whom they believe, right? And it says this, even as the Lord gave to every man. That's why I wanted to show you that, because it says that. That means God is giving someone like Paul and Apollos to everyone. And that's how people believe. That's how people come to believe. Sorry, you know what? My computer is slowing down because they have this too many programs open, I think. But anyway, so that's why they believe. Because of Paul and Apollos, because God gave ministers such as Paul and Apollos to every man, including the Corinthians, and then the, it, it happened to work with the Corinthians, you know? Obviously, if God gives, it, gives such people to every man, that means God is, is sending it out there for everyone in the whole world. Oh, wait, did I freeze? Hang on. Can you guys see me? Oh, wait, yeah, okay. I guess you can see me now, right? Uh, what's going on here? Hang on. Anyway, so, yeah, God gave it to every man, not just, not just the believers, every man. So if, Paul, if God is sending out people such as Paul and Apollos to every man, and of course he means every man and woman here, right? That means that, Paul, that, that God is sending people such as that to preach the gospel to everyone, everyone, all right? So everybody has a chance to believe, and then it's up to them. To either take, either believe what this servant of the Lord has has told you, or don't. And if you do, then you're going to be a Christian. And if you don't, then you're going to go to hell. You know. But you might get you might get another chance to believe it, maybe, or you can just believe it yourself. I don't know. But I'm just saying. Clearly, God gives somebody like Paul and Apollos are the are the ministers by whom they believed. It's not because God made them. God, whatever God gave the increase means here, whatever that means, it doesn't mean that he made them believe. Because as we read in the previous verse, it is Paul and Apollos by whom they believed. So something that these guys said got these people to believe. They persuaded them. <clears throat> they persuaded them somehow to believe the gospel. Okay? Okay. And we know it's by persuasion because, for example, we can see this in Romans 4 here. I'll show you this one too. Um, see, he's talking about Abraham here. Uh, he's talking about Abraham. And so this is like Paul's kind of comparing Abraham's salvation not comparing, he's showing that they're analogous. So Abraham's salvation is analogous to the salvation of the Christian. And it's because he believed, he believed the promise of God. He believed the promise and it was counted unto him for righteousness, as it says. Uh, Genesis 15. And so... He believed it, and so it was counted unto for us. So, but this, let me read you this passage. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded, he was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Okay? So, because he believed... It was imputed to him for righteousness. And we see this earlier again, earlier in the chapter as well. And again, this is just quoting Genesis 15, or I think Genesis 15 or Genesis 12. I'm not quite sure. Uh, oh, okay, maybe it's not here. Oh, yeah. For if Abraham were justified by our works... Uh, what shall we say then of Abraham? What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? 
For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. That's another passage that's good for, I'll talk about that in another video. But look at this. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. All right, and this is from Genesis 12, I think, or 12 or 15. And so he believed God is counted unto him for righteousness. So similarly, when we believe God, the gospel, then it's counted unto us for righteousness, just by believing. Not by anything you do, just by believing, just like Abraham. And then that's why it's important to remember that, look, he was persuaded to believe God. It wasn't just some, like God magically changed his brain or anything. Nothing. Nothing about that. He was, he was persuaded somehow. Who persuaded him? I don't know. Probably God. I mean, God's giving you these instructions and doing these miraculous things. That's pretty persuasive. And now we've seen miracles in the fact that Jesus Christ happened. That event, you know, that event, the Jesus event, which changed the whole world, never to be the same ever again. How does that happen? How does one man do that? One man from some backwater of the Roman Empire, never wrote a book, never conquered a country, but he's the most, he's the most famous person in world history by leaps and bounds. Change the world, never to be the same again. How does that happen? It's because he is the son of God, you know? And if you, and if you just like, oh, I don't believe it. Well, that's why, that's what you get. That's, that's why. Because you don't sit and think about it. Wait a minute. Does that make any sense? Oh, it kind of does make sense, you know? And then you're just like, then you can, be, you can go to heaven, you know? But if you're like, oh, that's stupid. Then you go to hell. Because you never... You never even like took the time to think about it and say, hey, you know what? What if there is a God? What if he does love me? What if he does want to save me from hell? Anyway, so that's that. So Abraham was persuaded, okay? But it's like, yeah, so God gives, God gives these ministers such as Paul and Apollos to everyone. Everyone. And I, I'll show you one more thing, actually. It's in um, Acts chapter 8. There's this story of this Ethiopian eunuch. So what's going on is, is Philip is going around and preaching the gospel to different people, right? And then the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So he goes into the desert. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, a queen of the Ethiopians. So this guy had come to Jerusalem for to worship because he's one of these people, they call them God-fearers. These are Gentiles who had heard about the God of Israel and just something about him was just compelling to them. You know, maybe it's the mor morality he taught or maybe... They just sense something is different about this God. And so they go, okay, that's the God I, I'm going to worship. And so he's one of those people. So he started going down there. But he's on his way back home now. He's sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. That's Isaiah. Okay, King James has that. They spell it that way. Um, it only sp uh, King James only spells it this way in the... Um, in the New Testament, because they're taking it from the Greek spelling of the name, and they're just sort of, they call it transliteration. Rather than, rather than translate the, the word into a Greek word, which is the same name, the name Isaiah, right? They just take, they take the name and they spell it in Greek letters. And that's the same thing we do with many of these words as well, right? We take these, these, words and we, t we spell them in English letters, you know? But that's what they do with, with Isaiah. And so it becomes something like sounding like Isaiah, I guess. I don't know. And then, so then the King James preserved that. But in the Old Testament, they just write Isaiah. Because they, they're, now they're translating the, the name. Or I guess even that's kind of a, Isaiah, even that's kind of a transliteration too, right? But anyway. 
So the spirit says unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip ran hither to him and, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? So th what I'm trying to say though here is that this man, he's, he's already seeking God. He's seeking God. And if you seek, you will find, right? He's seeking God. He's, he's, he heard about God. He, that's why he used to go and visit in the, in the um, temple in Jerusalem and worship there. Then, and then he's trying to learn more about God. He's reading Isaiah. And then so God knows his heart, right? So God says, okay, this guy's ready to hear the gospel. So then he sends Philip. Philip preaches the gospel to him. The man believes and he's baptized just in, in, in this very story. He gets baptized and now he's saved. He's going to heaven. Okay. Philip said, if thou believe, like this guy goes, and they went on their way. They came unto a certain water and the eunuch says, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and, they, and the, the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So that's what I mean. Like, so God literally sent Philip for the purpose of preaching the gospel to this man so that he could be saved and go to heaven. And then he just took Philip away, you know? like the, the, This is like caught away he caught him away this is that word harpazo this is the word that they have like you know there's this thing they call the rapture and some some christians talk about that and that's the word like because and sometimes it sounds like in in, in um uh, i think it's in first thessalonians 4 talks about how how they'll be they'll be caught away you know and and that's the word harpazo. And then in the Latin Bible, that that word harpazo was translated into some Latin word that sounds like rapture, like rapturo or whatever it is, right? I don't know exactly the word. And then that word became rapture in English, even though it was never translated that way in any English Bible, as far as I know. It, it it's just that concept of God snatching the people away. That's been referred to as the rapture in um, many circles. So anyway, that's that. Oh, let me show you one more because I always, anyway, a lot of people who watch my, my stuff have probably seen this already, but because I always kind of go through these ones, but there's other stories like this, like, you know, there's Peter and um, Cornelius in, in Acts chapter 10, I believe where there's this guy Cornelius he's a gentile right and he's just like this guy he's a god fearer he 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 worships god the god of israel even though he's a gentile you know and then and then god sends peter to him peter preaches the gospel to him and then he gets saved and, and he gets the holy ghost and all of them start speaking in tongues and stuff acts chapter 10 so that's another uh, example of People who who are kind of receptive to God's uh, thing, right? God's sort of prompting, right? The people who, who are like that, God will just send someone, as it says in, as it says here in 1 Corinthians 3, ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man, every man. Right, so that that's what I think is happening here. Is that's why God sent the the Philip to the eunuch. That's why He sent Peter to Cornelius. And that's why He sent Paul and Apollos to Corinth. And that's how I think pretty much everybody hears the gospel. You know, now maybe nowadays people hear it on TV or on YouTube or whatever, but in a, it's kind of similar in the way that God is sending. God could, the same way God sent Philip to do this job, right? He, he could send someone to do 
a YouTube video, you know, somebody who he knows, or he could just kind of like, or the, or the YouTube video got made because the guy is a Christian and he wants to make a YouTube video about about the gospel. But then, how did how did God send the person to see it? Maybe God just kind of, you know, twisted the YouTube algorithm so that thing came up on the guy's thing, and then the guy's like, ah, let me click on that one, and then and then. And God knew he would do that or whatever, you know, that's how it could be that God sends every single person. That's how they believe the gospel. Maybe. I don't know. But there's, these are these stories and there are others. You know, even earlier in Acts chapter eight, there was a story about this guy. I mean, Philip gets kind of goes to this place in Samaria and there's all these people there and he, and he preaches the gospel to them. And then they get. They get converted. But then even them, they like they believed what Philip was saying, but they didn't get the Holy Ghost until Peter and John showed up. This is earlier in Acts chapter 8, before that story about the Ethiopian eunuch. So you can check that out. But anyway, I was going to show you one more thing, which is um, John 6.44. Because they, a lot of the Calvinists like to bring out this one too. They, they'll say, look, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. So they think draw him means, come to me means believe in, in me. Jesus, This is Jesus talking, right? Of course, right? No man can come to me. Come to me means believe in, in me. Believe in Jesus. That's, I mean, in John, especially in chapter 6, that's what that means, okay? Not every time in John, but probably not even every time in chapter six, but when they talk like this, when these, that's what that means clearly. Okay. There's no other thing that that means. So no one can come to me except the father, which has sent me draw him now. That, so the Calvinists and the predestinarians will try to say that this means God is making them believe because they draw, he draws the person and then they come to Jesus. So first he draws them. Then they come to Jesus, come to Come to me is believe. So unless God draws you, you can't believe. So that means in their mind that God has to make you believe. Okay? Now, it does say, I will point out here, it says no man can come to me. No man can. It doesn't say that when God draws you, you will believe, which is what those predestinarians and Calvinists are arguing. They're saying that God literally makes people believe. He, If he decides that you're going to believe, you will. And if other people, they don't believe, it's because he never chose them. But if he chooses you, you will believe. It's not a matter of you. He's not giving you the choice. It's... Either you believe or you don't, and it's all based on God's choice. It's never your choice, okay? That's their belief, the predestinarians and the Calvinists. Both of them teach that. But this is no man can come to me unless the Father draws him. So the Father draws him, and then you can come to Jesus. Not that you will, right? So this verse actually disproves their claim. All right, but they're they're like they don't read the thing carefully. All right, they're just looking for verses that they can twist to make you believe their their theology. All right, but if you read the very next verse, it says it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, all, all. Okay, and then he, but then what does he say? Every man. I mean, this is that's that's his thing from the prophets. That one sentence, and they shall be all taught of God. Then the next part, that's just him talking. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So every man that does these things comes to Jesus, that is, believes in Jesus. Come to me, as we spoke, as we discussed earlier, come to me means believe in me. Believe in Jesus. Okay? So every man... And that's every man and woman and even children. Therefore, that hath heard 
and hath learned of the Father comes to Jesus. So they have to hear about God and then they have to learn about God. And every man that does those two things comes to Jesus. That is, they, the, the, they believe in Jesus. Not that they can. That's not what he says. That's 644. If, a, if, a, if God draws them, then they can come. They can believe. They have the ability. But John 6.45 doesn't say that. It says, Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned comes. Okay? So the reason why I point this out is that that's what, exactly what happened to the Ethiopian eunuch. Right? He heard about God. That's why he used to go to Jerusalem and worship. And then he started reading Isaiah. That means he's trying to learn more. He's learned of the Father. He's trying to learn about him more. And then he comes to Jesus. Um, so, yeah. That's, uh, that pretty much shows you that it's not God making, making people believe. There's another thing I saw. This guy was talking about it here. See, this whole section, right, is, it starts kind of here. Where these guys, these Pharisee people or whatever, they're here, right? It's it, like John calls them the Jews, right? But they're like, they're probably some kind of religious leaders, right? But then he says, they said, therefore unto him, what sign shewest thou then? that we may see and believe thee. What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He's saying, God has given you, these unbelieving Jews, these people that are not going to believe, and, we'll, and if you read later on in the chapter, there were some of them that believed, but most of them didn't. Okay? But he says, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. That's him. That's Jesus. Jesus is the bread from heaven. The true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. Then they said, then they said, Lord, evermore give us this bread. He said to him, to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth me shall never thirst. So it's like cometh to me is believe again, right? So that's that's why this is what they call a parallelism. In in Hebrew literature, they'll kind of repeat themselves. It looks like they're repeating themselves, but they say it in a in a slightly different way, and that's kind of the way they talk and also when they well it's the way they talk usually in more poetic context and, and Jesus is being a little bit poetic here he's saying I'm the bread of life and you will never hunger you will never thirst well he's not talking about literally never getting hungry again and never getting thirsty again he's saying about spiritually he's not bread he's he's a he's a man right but he's he's a if you believe in him you will, you will never hunger or thirst spiritually. And also, you'll never die. But he says, But I said unto you, that you, ye also have seen me and believe not. But God gave them the bread of life, right? My Father, have, have give it, my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. But they don't believe. Okay? And so, and then it says here, and then this one they they picked too. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. How does God give them? It's the same as like God drawing them, my opinion, you know? It's the same way he sent the, the, spirit, the spirit sent Philip to the eunuch. That's how he gives them to Jesus. Or that's how he draws them in John 6.44. He, he already knows their heart. He knows they're, they're, they're ready to believe, right? And then he sends the preacher. 
But it's never about him making them believe. Giveth me doesn't mean all that the father made the people believe. And and, and you know what? It's, it's look how it's separate things, right? Giveth me shall come to me. Come to me is believe in him, right? So giveth me is not believe in him. And so people might say, oh, well, giveth me is the is the if is the cause and if you don't have that causal factor then you can never believe well again first corinthians 3 there that i was showing you before who are paul who is paul who is apollos but ministers by whom you believe even as the lord give to every man every man he gives a minister like paul and apollos to every man probably even unbelievers too he probably waits until the moment when the unbeliever is like, okay, if he if he doesn't believe it now, he's never going to believe it. And then he sends the guy. Yeah? And the guy doesn't believe it? Well, I knew that was going to happen. But he just he gives them that chance anyway. Because it does say every man. It doesn't say every believer. It says every man. Yeah? So I think God, I mean, this is by whom, even as the Lord gave to every man. Right, so that's why I think, yeah, I, I don't, I think God wants everyone to be saved. You know, First Corinthians, uh, sorry, First Timothy, chapter two, three to four. So God wants everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. Okay, every man, but some people. They don't want to be saved. So that's their that's their thing. It's on them. But with these Calvinists and these uh predestinarians, they don't think about how that makes God unjust. Because they think, oh well, we can't judge God on morality and justice because it's God is the judge. So if God decides to send most of humanity to eternal torment and hell. And he decides to choose some of us to go to heaven. That's entirely up to him. And in a way, that's somewhat true. But we, we understand that God is just. And we understand justice because of him. And God's justice is one... I mean, we, we understand that it's unjust to punish somebody for something that they can't... Like, for not doing something that they can't do. Right? Right? So somebody, if somebody can't believe the gospel, let me show you one more verse before I go. Because somebody can't believe the gospel and then, and then you punish them for not believing the gospel, well, that's not just. And so knowing that God is just, we know that that's not something he would do. So everyone knows this one, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But if we keep reading here, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he doesn't send Jesus to condemn us. He wants to save us. That's why he sent Jesus, right? But then what happens? Keep reading. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he, he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So were they literally being condemned for not believing? Or maybe it's, maybe that's not, because he that believed it not is condemned already. So it's not for not believing. I think it's because you already have sin. And so, oh, I guess so. So maybe that's true. So I was I used to say that, Oh, but look what it says. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only... Because if the people say that, oh, God just punishes you because he didn't... Or, like, he picks some people to believe the gospel and others he, he, choose, he doesn't choose them. So they can't, right? That's what Calvinists and predestinarians say. But if that's the case, that means, look, as it says here, because he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So that means that God is literally condemning them because they did not believe. They did not believe the gospel. But if the people can't believe the gospel unless God makes them, 
then it's unjust to punish them for not believing it because they can't right it's like me tell it's like me punishing someone or it's like me punishing a, a man in a wheelchair for not walking right he can't walk so punishing him for not walking is obviously unjust right and so it's the same for god and again, people will say, well, you can't judge God's morality. Well, I'm not. God is the one who taught us what is justice. And every single human being on the face of the earth who who is a right-thinking person will, will think, will understand that punishing someone for not doing something they can't do is, is not just. Okay? I think everyone understands that. It's not rocket science. So anyway, I hope that wasn't too long and rambling. I thought, I thought this thing was going to be like 15 minutes to turn it into an hour. But anyway, I hope you guys got something out of that. And thanks for watching Toronto Bible Study. Oh, this seems... Anyway, hallelujah.